depending on, uh, to help these people. So it's, um, and I think a lot of people think of Hawaii, you go and you go to a resort and it's an expensive place to go and play golf and da 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 da. Uh, mo most of the people that live there are like people who live around the villages who, wa who wait tables and work uh, uh, maintenance jobs and so forth. Uh, the, the, most of the people who live on Maui are not, are not wealthy and it's really expensive to live there. So uh, they're, they're in a bad way and they will be in a bad way for a while to come. So uh, I'd like us to do, if you're able to do it, some, some sort of a, an offering that we can send over to the Makaweo Church because I know that it will get spent to provide food and clothing and things that emergency needs and it's not going to go to provide uh, a large salary for a Red Cross executive or whatever. So uh, if you would like to contribute to that, uh, just make sure you mark in your check in the memo section that it's for uh, Maui relief or the Maui wildfires or something that allows us to know that that's where it's supposed to go. And uh, uh, I won't be here next week, but I think we can do this again next week and then uh, whatever we do this week and next week, we need to get it over there because uh, the need is now, not, not, well, it'll be a long time, but they really need the money now. So if you're able to help, we'd, we'd appreciate you doing that too, okay? Also, out on the table in the narthex, uh, there's a bunch of flower charts. And I'm always saying good things about the village florists who are our, our go-to flower shop and have really treated us well all these years. Uh, their flower calendars are out there. They gave them to me to, to give to you. So if you want one, pick them up before they're gone. And um, the older flowers this morning are given by Julia Dale. And they're given in loving memory of uh, her husband Ed, and also of her children, in memory of her children, Aaron and Conrad. So thank you for the beautiful hazes from Julia. Uh, and the floral centerpiece uh, is there in honor of the wedding anniversary of Murray and Karen Deutsch. So happy anniversary uh, to them. And thank you for the flowers. Very pretty. Uh, next week, our guest speaker will be Reverend Mark Nelson. Uh, Mark is a graduate of uh, University of Florida. Uh, he also is a, a graduate of the uh, Reformed Theological Seminary over in Oviedo. And uh, uh, after he graduated from seminary, instead of going into a church right away, he uh, went out to California and California and Texas and so on. For 10 years, he was a cowboy. So uh, it's. Uh, He's got an interesting background. He and then, uh, after he started cowboying, he met his lovely wife, and they have uh, three wonderful children. And he he will be here to uh, to preach for you. He's not here candidating for the pulpit or anything like that. He's just filling in for me, and uh, I think you'll enjoy him very much. Um, he's got a, he's got a, a Tom Selleck mustache, and he's a big guy, so he's yeah, quite a, quite an interesting fellow. So I think you'll you'll enjoy next week with. Uh, Mark Nelson and his family. Uh, then two weeks from today, Kevin is putting together the jazz service, and uh, we have a drummer and a bass, and you know, tell them about who you have coming. Uh, well, just one, two, line up, well, and just, okay, well, it's just, uh, we're gonna have six people. Um, and uh, the Dixie Band, we have all the arrangements are all done, Trombone and guys from the uh, Shades of Blue, mostly. And, uh, and that's Similar to what we did a couple of years ago when yes. we did the jazz. So, this the platform is going to be filled with the, the band, yep. and Miss Billy will be singing. Yes. And uh, so, we'll have, we'll have some great jazz service. Uh, this is always one of our most popular services. People really respond really well to it. And Kevin, Kevin will be bringing the, uh, the little message on music in the uh, ministry of the church. By the way. Yes. Okay, friends do not let friends clap on one and three. <laughs> okay. If you say so. Two or four. That happened last night. They did. But what happens if they don't clap on one, two, three, or four? Oh, <laughs> I think they call that silence or a dud. So, okay. 
So don't, don't miss that two weeks from today, the jazz service, and then uh, three weeks from today and four weeks from today, Reverend David Wood will be here, uh, and uh, we, four weeks from today is the 9-11's uh, remembrance, and uh, uh, Lee will be singing, and we have uh, a really nice service for that plan. So uh, Dawn and I leave Thursday for Scotland and Ireland, and uh, we will be back uh, mid-September. So. Um, I think you have some nice services. Please come out and support all these good folks that will be doing services for you while I am gone. Um, Next week is uh, Lori Gill. Yes, and as far as music in the service, next week is Lori Gill. Yeah. And then who's. Uh, well, I got a text this morning because I was going to church. It's from Lori Gill. She said, Is it church on 301? Uh-oh. I said, yes, but you're next week. There's a long pause. And then a text, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> Not my fault, it's her. Well, if you were if you were in the Lutheran or the Presbyterian church, we'd have to excommunicate you for that. <laughs> the congregational church, oh crap, is okay. <laughs> Okay, so she will be here next week. And um, let's see, we, ben, oh, that Ben isn't coming till September, right? That's the 24th of September, Ben will be here. And uh, Kathy Chelsea Williams is with us this morning. She's been here before. And we're glad to have her back. She's listening to her practice, I think you're gonna like that. And. Um, I'm trying to think if there was something else that was, oh, well, I wanted to tell you about the, uh, the dolls. You know, we, with a, a number of women have made these beautiful dolls, and uh, we give them out to children who are going through a tough time, or they've lost a, a parent or a sibling, and uh, you can see one of them on the table out there. Uh, some of you have sponsored those for a $50 donation, and that's what it takes to buy the, the things that we need to, to do it. Uh, but we also give those dolls to Alzheimer's patients. What's the name of the organization? This one was One Woman Cafe. Yeah, the One Woman Cafe is one of the two Alzheimer's groups that we support. And uh, they were here yesterday and they picked up three of the dolls from uh, Leslie and uh, the first three to go out to Alzheimer's patients. And they're going to take some pictures of the people with their, with their new doll and uh, let us have a, a little contact with them. So. Uh, we just want to tell you that that doll ministry is, is picking up and good things are happening. How many do we have yesterday, kids? 31. 31. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So and on top of the three Alzheimer's patients, we have 31 children who, who uh, received help. That's, that's a great thing. That's a really good thing. Well, this was, um, this was also a really sad week for me personally and for our church. As a family, um, early in the week, uh, my good buddy uh, Dave Zecker passed away, and uh, we prayed for him last week, and he passed away uh, 5:45, I think, on Tuesday morning, wasn't it? <laughs> so uh, Sherry is here this morning. Uh, I wanted us to remember him. There'll be a memorial service in early October, and we'll tell you about that later uh, as we get closer to the time. But we wanted to remember Dave this morning. Uh, Dave and Sherry have been with me a long time with our church and part of this part of this family. And uh, when we built this building, uh, Dave came down and volunteered because he was in the building business. He knew, he knew the Ohio building code by heart. I think it was safe to say he knew the Ohio Building Code better than he knew his Bible, but he knew that too. <laughs> so, so uh, but anyway, he would walk around and, and watch while this was all being built and report back if he saw something that didn't look kosher to him. And uh, so he's, he's just been a good friend and, and, uh, and funny and just a, a really nice man. And uh, I'm going to uh, miss him for the remaining days I have here, and I'll, I'll think of him often. He was, just a very good guy, even if he was an Ohio Buckeye. <laughs> Can't hold that against him. So the candle that you see before you this morning burns in, in memory of our friend Dave Zecker. 
and I ask you to observe a moment of silence with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we know that the, the difficulty of losing a friend, losing a loved one, is ours, not theirs. Dave is in a better place where there is no more angst and disagreeing and problems or sicknesses or everything is, in your word, perfect. And so we're grateful that he is there with you we ask you to help us through these uh, days of missing him, uh, through these days of uh, uh, separation. But give us the same peace that you have given him, the same assurance that is now his truth. And help us to one foot in front of another, keep on going and do and be the, the things that he would want our church to be. That we might honor him and also honor you at the same time. For all that you have done, for the memories, for the goodness that was Dave, we give you thanks and praise. In Christ's name, amen. Consider 
day the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. We worship Him together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come and celebrate the reign of God. The reign of God is beyond our imagining. See the little seed that becomes God's commonwealth, where all can find shelter and peace. We delight in the vast treasure of God's presence. Throw out the net and see the great catch. There is abundance in God's great sea. So reach under your chairs and get your hymnals. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start with number 372, Our God Reigns. And uh, it's fairly short, so I think we'll do, let's see, what will we do? All three.
We have a number of uh, prayer shawls this morning. Three of them. And I'd like to have a couple of folks come up and join me, please, while I share with you that uh, this first one is for Joy Trash, and uh, she has a malignant brain tumor, and uh, Mary Starkweather asked for that one. This one is for um, Donna Blodgett, who has some health issues, and uh, Kathy Steiber was asking for that one. And this last one is for Ryan Akers, who is my son-in-law, uh, who continues to be in ICU in Tennessee, making some improvements. So. Gracious Heavenly Father, there's so much sadness and so much sickness around us. Life has its mountaintops and its joys, but it also has its difficulties. So we pray for these who will receive these prayer shawls, that they might understand that they come through the power of the Holy Spirit, that they come with the hopes and the prayers of this congregation who has dedicated them. And we pray, Lord, for each of them, that there might be healing and strength, that there might be an encouragement that falls upon them, that they might know your presence. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, each of us come to this place of worship today with someone on our heart, someone in our mind who needs a special touch from you. We lift them up before you now in this time of prayer. We come to this altar, your throne of grace, and in our mind and in our heart we mention their name before you. We reach out to you asking that you would provide for them just what they need, that there might be healing for those who are sick, that there might be encouragement for those who are down and distressed, filled with anxiety, that there might, Heavenly Father, for those who grieve, be an assurance of the promise that your Son has gone to prepare a place for each of us. Reach out, Father, in your power, in your glory, in your majesty, with miracle-working touch, with a feel, with a strengthening that goes beyond this room and this place, which travels on our thoughts, which goes to the far corners of this earth and touches lives. Help us to believe that prayer is more than just an exercise, more than just a spot in the service that we need to get through, but that we touch the transcendent power of the creator of everything. That as we speak to you, we speak as Moses spoke, as a man speaks to his friend, that you hear our words, that you know our thoughts, that you know the desires and the needs that we have even when we can't put them into words. We ask, Heavenly Father, for these miracles for those that are on our heart today, and we ask for them for every person in this place, that we might leave this place different than the way we came, that there might be healing and strength, and that there might be Jesus. For we pray these things in his name, the one who taught us the prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our 
debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time we'll worship the Lord with the receiving of our morning tithes and offerings.
other man told me I was supposed to stay hydrated. <laughs> it's an old story I heard years and years ago. This evangelist came to town and uh, he had a series of nights where he was preaching on different topics. And one night he gathered all the people together. They were out in a big tent in the center of the town on the town green. And he was preaching about the evils of alcohol and drunkenness. And he would go over and over the Bible verses and the personal experiences that, that he had had with people who were uh, bound by alcohol and how they ought to take all of the, the liquor from every bar and every liquor store and every home in town and they ought to gather it all up and put it in wagons and they ought to take it down to the river at the edge of town and they ought to dump it right into that river. And the choir director got up when he finished and they sang, we shall gather at the river. <laughs> be like holding a temperance rally and asking the town drunk to get up and share his uh, testimony. Or maybe you were organizing a, a rally on sexual purity, so you went down to the uh, houses of ill repute and got a panel of all the young ladies to come up and tell of their exploits. Well, today's almost as bad. I'm going to talk about patience. I'd be like kind of the town drunk or watch your ladies of the evening because I have no patience. So what I say is kind of like the old story about when somebody says, you don't practice what you preach. Well, I preached Jesus and Jesus was perfect and last time I looked, I'm not. And if I look and I think I am, I ask my wife and she says, you're not. <laughs> it strikes me that... Uh, you and I really need, in this world we live in, to be more patient. I want to do something here. Let's move this over here. I want to be able to see Gunner there. <laughs> that was in the road. Over the years, I've, I've had to be patient. Someone asked me when I was leaving the church after 20 years in uh, Michigan, what is it, the, the worst part, what is it that makes you want to, to move on? And I said to them, I knew it was time to move on when I started burying my friends instead of the parishioners. When you're in a church long enough and you've got enough of a, a track record with that church that the people who pass on are are not just acquaintances, or not just members of the church, or members of a board, but they're your friends. It starts getting to be more than you can handle. Four years of college, three years of seminary, two years of the doctoral program, you finally get all of this education, and nobody ever taught you how to deal with what you deal with in the church. I talk to teachers, it's the same thing. You can go to four years of education and do your student teaching and maybe even get a master's degree and you walk into that classroom with those little monsters and nobody ever taught you that. <laughs> it's a whole different ball game. Or if you're a doctor, you go through med school, you go through internship, you set up a practice, somebody comes in the first time or the second time or the third time and their wife comes in and maybe you have their children and next thing you know the family is, is friends and dad has a heart attack or mom gets cancer and it's a whole different ball game and this thing they call practicing medicine. Even after you reach your goals, even after you think you've, you've made it there, even after you've done the things you set out to do, there's still always something to vex you, something different, something hard, something to cause you to be patient. And being patient in the midst of crisis, being patient with difficult situations, 
watching people suffer, watching people go through hard times, wanting to help everybody but having limited resources to do it, requires you to be patient, whether you're the preacher or the board member or just a member of the church or a member of the community. There are times when you're sure that God is leading us to accomplish a task, a certain thing that is in our mind that, that we need to do, a goal that we, we have. It doesn't always come quickly. And it certainly never comes as quickly as we would like it to come. We need the full measure of God's fruit of the Spirit that the Bible talks about. The full measure of chapter 5 of the book of Galatians, Paul's letter. And one of those fruit of the Spirit is, is patience. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Those are the things which, which we as Christians are supposed to manifest to the world. I think one of the hardest is, is patience. It's waiting on God and waiting on God's time. We want to set things up so that we can control it. We want to set things up so that, that we were part of the, the solution or the program. When in reality, it's God's program, not yours. It's God's church, not mine. It's God's future, and we have little control other than to submit to his will and to do his bidding if we want that wonderful world to be unleashed before us. The world tells us, do your task heartily as to the Lord. If you think of the tasks that you have in life, the people that you're called on to love, the, the problems that you're called on to, to be a part of the solution, those things, they are not things for you to keep busy with. The church is not a place for you to uh, put out your inner Lions Club membership. It is different. You don't pay your dues to church. You give your honor and your glory and your offering to God. It's not another club. It's not a place for you to express your politics. It's a place for you to serve the Lord our God, to do his bidding, to do his will. The reason is that it's tough to wait on other people. It's tough to wait on circumstances to line themselves up so that uh, everything is going the way you want it to go. You're really not ever waiting on anybody else. You're not even waiting on yourself. There's no amount of work you can do to make it happen. The reality is that if good things are going to happen, if the world is going to change, if the church is going to survive, if we're going to do those things which, which make us feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves, then we need to be waiting on God. Because really, patience is the willingness to await God's time. You know, I talk to people about the second coming of Christ, and they say, well, you know what? If Jesus was coming, where is he? He said, if I go away, I will come again. Where is he? The same Bible that we pull that out of says that to God a day is like a thousand years. Well, unfortunately, you and I don't have a thousand years to wait. We want it now. We want him tomorrow morning. But the word is the word. And God's time is God's time. And so it may not happen for us that, that we get what we want when we want it, either in the coming of Christ or in the healing of our bodies or in the healing of a friend or a loved one. It comes in God's time. And sometimes it doesn't come in the way that we want it to come. It comes in the way God willed it to come. Jesus on the cross says, not my will but thine be done. We pray it in the Lord's Prayer for the will of God to reign. We want the will of God to be our desire, not our desires. The Lord is saying that to us over and over again. 
If we want the kingdom to come, we must understand and submit to the will of God. <clears throat> really, really tough. Really hard. For a, a selfish and stiff-necked generation, for a nation of independent-minded people, to a, a world that thinks that everyone has their share of what's right. We all know, of course, that we're right. I used to have a poster that I hung in my office and a picture of this nasty looking black leopard on it. And the title on the poster was, everyone's entitled to my opinion. <laughs> that should be the mantra of the modern culture. Everybody's entitled to our opinion. And patience comes from trying to dictate to God what and where and how life is going to work. And it never works. That's why you're impatient. That's why you're unsatisfied. That's why it doesn't come out the way you wanted it to. Because it's not your will that is to be done. It is God's will that is to be done. Patience comes when you realize who is really on the throne. It may come as a shock to you, some of you kings and queens and princes and princesses, that you are not on the throne. I am not on the throne. Thank goodness. In the months ahead, I believe that two things are possible pathways for our church, for this faith community. And as I always say, I have bad news and good news. Two paths, bad news and good news. Let's start with the bad news, because it's always better to end on the good news. This church has the possibility of being like so many other churches around the country. Wouldn't it be good to be like everybody else? Wouldn't it be good to be like other churches? Not really. Because around this country, churches are closing. If they're not closing, they're losing their direction. They're not worshiping God. They're flying rainbow flags and getting off into political stuff that divides and separates. Historic denominations are being split down the middle. I think I told you before that my friend who's in the nursing home now up in uh, York, Pennsylvania, who John, who, who's gone pastored for 50 years like I have, went to seminary with me. He's a United Methodist, and he's, he's so sad over the split in the Methodist Church into the Global Methodist Church and the United Methodist Church. And in his county, 40 United Methodist churches have walked away from the United Methodist Church and been part of this, this divide and this split and this disagreement. And it doesn't matter what the issues are as much as it matters how much pain this is causing all these people. People who want to go to church and, and want to hear the gospel, want to hear that Jesus loves them, want to know that there's a heaven, want to know that there's a healing or at least the, the strength to get through the sickness, want to be encouraged about their grandchildren's future. They don't want to hear all of this divisive stuff that isn't going to be solved, isn't going to go away because the church gets involved in it. Now the church can go down that road if it wants to. That is part of the way. You can be filled with self. You can look at what makes you feel good. I told you about the preacher who came out of one of my services one time and I had been preaching about missions and about the need to, to do more and the, the, that we weren't really doing what God wanted us to do unless we were sacrificing to help others. That we, were, that we would be putting to those other people's needs like our kids in the kids' pantry and, and, and these people in Maui. We'd be putting that ahead of our own worries about ourselves. Because I believe when we do that, that's when the explosion of growth and spirit and, and faith takes place. You can put forth a, a critical spirit in the church. So many churches, whether they're into the, the divisiveness or not, they're still divided. 
There's a, a pecking order. There's a, a fussing and a fighting over who's controlling what. I think it's kind of humorous that with all the fussing and the fighting and what I read, it's worse than ever before as far as, as, far as inner wranglings in, in, in local churches. And I think it's so funny that the more the inner wrangling takes place, the more the divisiveness takes place, the more the fussing over who's running what takes place, the further down the churches go. It isn't that these people who are trying to, to make things work their way are, are changing the life of the church. Their churches are closing. Their pastors are leaving. Uh, they can't find people to do anything. And it's the critical spirit that brings that death, not growth. We can look backward and, and we can bemoan what used to be instead of look forward to his grace. Someone told me a few weeks ago when I was talking to them from my church up in uh, Michigan, they said, you know, the day you left the church was the high point in our church and it's never been the same and it'll never be the same after that. And I said, not my fault. Not my fault. You have all the key ingredients, all the things that you need, and shame on you if you don't continue to serve Jesus. Because it's not all about me. It's not all about you. It's all about him. You can allow others who have real need to be seen and to control and to lead in your place. Or you can get involved and you can pray and you can give and you can work. Do you realize how important church is to this culture? You know, for those that think it'd be such a great thing if all the churches would go away, <laughs> think how much your taxes will go up to do all the good works for all the poor and all the needy and all the educational things that the churches do. Think how much your taxes will go up to make up for what the churches do if the churches disappear. If you have no other spiritual reasons for it, at least realize it's going to cost you money. Big money. Do we really want that to be our direction? And finally, you can help to shut down the church like so many others have done by refusing to work, by saying we never did it that way before. You know, we have come a long way, baby, since 12 people in a motel and rental facilities a long way. But that doesn't mean it was the only way. It doesn't mean it was the right way. It just got us here through the rough beginning times. Now the, the road is stretched out before you like an amazing highway. And off of that highway are all of these interchanges. And at each interchange is an opportunity to experience amazing things for the gospel, for helping others. There is nothing that should limit in the future. So that is one way. You could let all that stuff weigh you down and you could lose your ground and you could lose your spirit and you could give up. Or you could rise to places that we've never seen yet. You could achieve things that you perhaps didn't even have the capabilities to dream of a few years ago. You could reach more children, you could do more scholarships, you could diaper more baby butts. You could change the world. Realize that every past accomplishment, every enjoyable moment, all the successes, all the service, all the missions, the family that we have become is not dependent on me or an office staff or a committee or a board or a musician or a way of doing things. It has nothing to do with a denomination or a church government format. It is what I've tried to say over and over and over again, and I don't say it because it sounds good. I say it because it's the God's honest truth. It's all about him or it's nothing. It's nothing. If you want the church to close, if you want to go back to the possibility number one, make it about something else. 
start a fuss, start a feud, spread some gossip, be lazy, cut back on your money, and watch what happens. I promise you. The future is not in the hands of a new pastor. It's not in the hands of a, a temporary pastor. It's not in the hands of a board or a committee. Anyone who comes in faith to leadership in the church, believing in doing great things, believing that they're standing on a foundation that has been laid for them, not for their glory, not for their ease, but to make a difference, to do something even greater and better. You now, there are churches in New England, congregational ones, that have endowments in the millions. They never have to take an offering ever again. Now there'll be a mass exodus going looking for those churches. <laughs> oh, that's, that, wouldn't that be great if we went to a church that they didn't ask us for anything? No, it wouldn't. Because you'd be in a dead church going nowhere. And that's exactly what happens to most of those heavily endowed churches. Not all but most of those heavily endowed churches in New England. They struggle for a purpose. They struggle to survive, even though they have all that money. Don't let anyone or anything replace the real power that must be in the church, Jesus Christ. With all the programs and all the dinners and all the lovings and all the mission programs and all that, if it isn't for him, you're wasting your time. You're spinning your wheels. You're still going to close. You're still going to lose. It's all about him. We patiently wait. We patiently believe but we roll up our sleeves and we get out there and we fight the good fight. We fight for every kid who's lost on drugs. We fight for every family that's broken and needs some help to make it through. We fight for food for the hungry. We fight for every kind of disaster that takes place, like Maui, to do everything we can to make a difference to help those people. We come together and we worship and we have a good feeling in our heart because we've done something. We've done something. And you should feel amazing about what you've done so far, about the beginning that you have had, about what God has done, about how we have honored him through every single dime, every single dollar, every single piece of clothing, every single act of volunteerism, every doll that's been made to make a difference in somebody's life. This morning you sent out a bunch of prayer shawls. Again, well over 400 now. We've seen the letters and the notes and we've felt the joy and the satisfaction. I got, a, I got another letter this week from a gal down at Vero Beach that we did down for a couple of weeks ago. And she just, she would, she would hug that thing at night my, she's a friend of my daughter's works for, my, for the pharmaceutical company my daughter works for. And you know, she's, she's in the pharmaceutical business, but she got her power from your prayer shawl. And uh, she wrote to say thank you for, for that prayer shawl and to let me know and to let you know through me that she just had a PET scan. And the PET scan is entirely clear. And what was stage four cancer is now not visible. Will it come back? I don't know. But right now, she believes and she knows that that prayer shawl was a source of strength in the midst of her battle. Those are the things that you have done and those are the things that you must continue to do. Those are the things that we have begun. Those are the memories that you have and those are the dreams that you will make. If you make it all about him, these small beginnings that we have experienced together will be memories of blessings that are yet to be. In the book of Revelation, there are churches, and those churches are described in various categories of 
being failures and being successes. The church at Laodicea is described as one that Jesus would spew out of his mouth, it says. It's disgusting. We want to be the church that he would embrace. You want to be the church that is all about him. You want to be the church that doesn't complain about what used to be or what could have been, but the church which looks forward to what yet will be. And I promise you this, if it's all about him, then the best is yet to come. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have shown us your glory, you have shown us your power, you have provided for us even in our laziness, and you have allowed us to help to make a difference. We ask you to allow that same spirit to continue, that leadership of the Holy Spirit to come and, and to be with us and to drive all of this forward to the next level, to the next amazing miracle, so that one day we will see as you return that we were part of that glorious day because of the foundation that we laid here. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So let's close with hymn number 426. Let's be the title. We're going to do all the verses. Behave yourselves while I'm gone. <laughs>